Okay, recording's on. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, from Sonetio Cybersecurity Solutions in Namibia. Hope you're having a wonderful Saturday. We are, for sure. And uh, we have one or two people from... Well, they haven't arrived yet, but uh, we may have some international participants, which would be awesome, as they could offer us some direction into what we're trying to do. My name is Andrew Fordred. I'm ably assisted by Kai Klangunter, who will be your host this afternoon for the panel discussion. Um, together with Joseph Fat, he will do the necessary introductions in that regard. And then along is our colleague, Rigo Reddich. He is our chief security engineer, AKA chief hacker, and occasionally makes me coffee, but that doesn't happen often. <laughs> Again, welcome to you all. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a good afternoon. If you have any questions, want to make any comments, please use the hand function to attract our attention to you. And then we can unmute you. I just ask you to give us a little bit of time to get through some of the discussions um, that we just maintain a nice flow of events that we don't get too late. And um, also at the end, we'll open up everybody's microphones and you can also feel welcome to chip in then as well. I'm going to give you a short presentation of as to what Sinetio does here in Namibia. And then you'll see me again at the end because we've got some juicy prizes, which we're giving away for everybody. So we'll be able to um, let you into some of those as well. Uh, let me just get the screen share going here. We go, just give me a thumbs up that you can see it. Oh, good. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so Netia Cybersecurity Solutions, founded by myself and Rigo, what, just over a year ago, and we've hit the ground running. And one of the reasons that we did is that the former director of the FBI, Robert S. Muller, said there are only two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that will be hacked. And this is true. It happens quite regularly. And our purpose in life and our main driving force is that we provide cybersecurity solutions for what is important to people through cost efficient and reliable and valuable service. So what does this include? We have our security services division, which does cybersecurity auditing and assessments. We do penetration testing and vulnerability assessments, red teaming. What red teaming is, is the simulation of an attack on your organization. Blue teaming is the defense of that. We also do social engineering assessments and awareness. You've all been, you've all probably received a phishing type email. Well, that's a type of security, uh, social uh, engineering. Also digital forensics and incident response and threat intelligence on the cyber landscape. Our intelligence services consist of open source intelligence, cyber investigations, due diligence, counterintelligence and risk and security intelligence. And then the main focus of our discussion this afternoon is data protection, where Kai will get into the meat of the issues there, and that involves compliance, data classification, protection strategies, policy and legal requirements such as GDPR. We keep on hearing about GDPR, but what is it? How does it affect us? And I'll leave that to them to, to focus on. And then the Poppy Act from South Africa, and then the banking regulations. We've also started a social responsibility cause known as the Cyber Institute. It is our center for research and training. We currently have just on 2000 students. Even though we are Namibian based, we have a global influence and we have many students and researchers along the road who are internationally based, which is great for us. Namibia is not just a small African country. We are going to change the world. And then cybersecurity subjects and research is covered by the Institute. And then we have a community. We have a YouTube channel where we publish all our, our videos. You can join it. You can see many different topics that we've dealt with there, such as cyberbullying and various others. We do webinars like this. Um, on a Saturday afternoon, sometimes on weekly evenings. And then we also have an online coaching facility. 
As I said, if you have any questions during the course of this um, webinar, please use the hand function or use the chat zone and just type in your statement or question there. Otherwise, wait to the end and we'll give everybody a fair opportunity to voice whatever they would like to voice. And with that, Kai, I hope I can hand over to you and you can, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Andrew. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, it's, um... Not yet. There we go. Not yet. There we go. It's coming. There we go. Can you see that? Secondary yep, yeah. one. <clears throat> All right. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A warm and hearty welcome to all of you. My name is Kai Klangenter. I will be Joining me are, once again, my, uh, my colleagues from Sinatia Cybersecurity, Andrew Fordred and Rigo Reddick. On our panel discussion, we today have um, Joseph Hutt, who is of an accolade. Uh, he is the chair of, uh, vice chairperson of the Internet Society. Um, we oversees the day-to-day -day activities of the organization. He's also the chairperson of the Namibia Forum. A working group and serves on the board of the Nam Namibian United States Alumina. He serves on various other boards as well. In his free time, Joseph articles on human rights and the impact of technology, thereby raising awareness of the issues of access to information for individuals and for Namibians. Unfortunately, our um, our second participant was put to cancel a short notice, so we will only be having Joseph Fatih here with us today, uh, joining, but also Riga will also be um, hosting or will also have a short presentation. Uh, thank you once again for joining us. This uh, webinar is based on the need for data protection and Namibian perspective. Without further ado, I would uh, like to stop my presentation. So the collection of information is not a new phenomenon. It has actually been around uh, for longer than we can think as old as society itself. Um, however, with the ever advancing um, developments in technology also comes the subsequent um, exploitation of personal information. This being said, computers are now able to store and disseminate more information faster than ever before. However, we also need to understand that information was collected during the COVID-19 regulations where this information was mostly done manually. Um, collection of personal information is ambiguous to our daily lives, meaning that we either submit voluntarily or involuntary data to say, for example, institutions, companies, and the like. And this needs to be brought across very urgently because we need to understand that this information that we share with with uh, participants mm. or with companies uh, means that we are, you know, we're exposed to exploitation issues in, in, in and around the world. And mm -hmm. if we look at how quickly the uh, records or how much records are collected, I mean, vast records are collected by companies, including not only your financial employment, medical information, but also your information, passport numbers, your medical aid numbers, your ID numbers. And this was once again very prominent during the COVID-19 regulations where we, where some sign-in re sign registers had to, well, we had to submit ID information, your name, your surname, your email address, and your telephone number. Um, and with this advancement, countries around the world have realized the importance of data privacy laws um, and data privacy laws set the standards and regulations for the lawful processing and collection of data in you know in within the vicinity of where you are now i know andrew spoke about this earlier the most prominent laws currently in place is the general data protection regulation for the european union um, there is however also laws like the california consumer privacy act which regulates the collection of uh, california residents and then bringing it back down to the south, we've got the uh, personal or the Protection of Personal Information Act, or for short, the Poppy Act, which regulates the collection of in personal information for our South African counterparts. <clears throat> now, defining privacy, privacy law. So what is privacy law? 
privacy law is the area that regulates the stages of lawful collection and processing of personal information or personal identifiable information. There's different meanings around the world, but for our discussion, we will focus on data privacy because that is one that is standing out the most, and it is also the one that will be spoken about the most in with going forward, also with the hopefully with promulgation of our act. Um, so what does data, data privacy law basically protects the individual or it is the it protects the individual personal information it safeguards the information of an individual where the information is collected from but it also allows organizations to be better guided so it gives them a, a, a framework to collect information and to allow these inform this information to be protected against unauthorized access and we will shortly speak about the risks also with regards to companies but also the risk of the individual user and the control of the user so once again um, the data or the the, the privacy law basically uh, takes this identification of the user which is your personal information and it protects you against unauthorized access by third parties or in the event of a data breach it sets the rules how in organizations should inform and what they should do in case of a data breach um, coming back to Namibia we currently do not have any type of uh, data protection law in Namibia we also don't have a consumer protection act nor okay there is a there is a draft bill in terms of cyber crime but it is not fully promulgated yet it is still in a drafting phase and when we often speak about data privacy we look at the uh, we look at the constitution and we look at article 13 which allows every individual user to have his or, or her information protected now this uh, specific information was derived from the united nations conference on trade and development which which listed namibia as one of the countries that currently does not have any of this protection in place and once again this came, became very prominent during the COVID 19 regulations when information had to be submitted to you know, on, on the sign-in uh, sign in registers and this information, unfortunately, uh, some of this information was also breached by third parties. There was apparently a um, one of the registers was stolen and that information was breached. Now, using these, if we consider the standards and guidelines, these would allow companies to take more control of your information, but also to protect you as the end user. Because at the end of the day, it is your information and if that information is leaked to, or is breached and leaked to the wrong people you may end up in quite a predicament uh, this may go as far as um, identification theft or even extortion possibly even you know um, a financial crisis that you may be facing due to uh, data breaches um, for information uh, for more information i will be sharing this link that is at the bottom there how Namibia is moving forward, but do please take uh, consideration the Electronic Transaction Act is already a promulgated act. It is not in draft legislation anymore. It has been. Uh, it is part of the legislation that we can use today. So I haven't spoken about the risks. We've, there are certain inherent risks in terms of data protection and also the lack of standards. Now, inherent risk can be can be manifold. Information may, may either be collected automatically or manually. And this means that information may either be incorrect or it may be irrelevant, it may possibly be incomplete, accessed by third parties or disclosed. Should those standards and regulations be in place or the law be in place, it would allow us to mitigate most of this of these issues. It would allow us for better uh, information or more better information that is collected, complete information that is collected. And it would create the standard for organizations to understand how to keep that information accurate and also how to safeguard the individual or the company from unauthorized access. Um, and this is what the inherent risk looks at if we currently, do, with the current uh, ways or way, with the current issues of not having standards in place, none of these factors can be mitigated because information may well be disclosed to third parties or it may be accessed or possibly even incorrect if the data subject or user submits information incorrectly <coughs> oh. 
you know, regulations and standards set guidelines for, for the right and control of users. Um, what, what I mean with this is that should we have standards and guidelines in place, organizations would be guided by, in, uh, would be guided in the process of collecting information, but it would just allow people to have to control and access to that information. Firstly, guidelines and standards would minimize or would increase the data quality, which means that the information should be collected fairly and lawful, uh, fair and lawfully. So all information is then uh, processed and that information is safeguarded. In terms of information storage, when we have standards and regulations in place, that information is stored for a specific legitimate purpose and for ways that are more, more compatible with why you're collecting that information. Hypothetically, taking into consideration the COVID-19 situation, once again, we, we saw individuals being targeted by companies with marketing information. And that was not the reason why we were so, we were able or why we should have submitted our information. It was so solely for the purpose of tracing, not for marketing. So that is what these standards and guidelines would protect you as the user from. Um, thirdly, you would uh, look at the adequate and relevant information. This means that the standards would allow you not to have too much access information collected. It, it would allow you to collect information for that specific purpose and for, for that purpose only. Um, any adequate, uh, info, well, not any, any inadequate information would then be obviously told to the in, individual or to the user, look, this is not necessary for the process, why we want to use that information. Um, but it would also allow companies to keep the information accurate. Now, once again, if we consider and think about financial sectors, these organizations would have to keep the information accurate and up to date. It also goes with medical aids that have to keep information accurate and up to date. And it would set the standards for exactly that. It would allow you to make those prom uh, permissions and say, listen, we need to keep information accurate. Is it okay if we collect more information and if we store it for a longer period? And then finally, um, the quality or the regulations would allow for the identification of the user himself, meaning that your inaccurate information that is submitted will now be able to be linked specifically to that individual. For example, taking myself, my name is Kai, so that would be my name. It would really identify me as the user or as the end user. But then also for in terms of data security, um, with standards and regulations in place, the individual would have more trust within the organization or within the company. So I would be able to submit more information to a, uh, to a company that is that has a policy in place, that is industry standard in place, and that information is then secured. Because the more that I can understand an organization has the right infrastructure in place, the more I'm willing to su submit information because I know that my information will be protected. And if, it, if there is a breach, that, that, that I'm informed in time. And that's what the rules and regulations for, for, for data protection sets down. If there's a breach, it allows you as the company to inform your users quickly enough of a data breach, thereby also mitigating certain risks. And having spoken about the risks, we will come to the last slide, which is the risk for organizations. First and foremost, standards and guidelines would allow companies to mitigate risk. Um, this is um, specifically if if it comes to data collection, like you you would you would be able to understand how to better mitigate the risk of a data breach, or if a data breach takes place, how do I mitigate all the other risks of reputational damage or financial damage? Because it would set the standard and guidelines for you to go forward and say. This user has been hacked, your information is out there, we are trying our best to resolve it. Now, without such standards in place or regulations in place, the severe impacts are quite horrendous for organizations. And we often look at professional damage. That information is lost or it has been breached or it has been accessed by a third party. I lose my trust in that organization. We say, listen, I'm going to unsubscribe from the organization. I'm I'm not feeling well with my data, it is not protected. But with that reputational damage also comes financial damage. Now financial damages can range from fines depending on the jurisdiction, but it, the fines can be horrendous. We can, they can be substantial for organizations. Not only that, you would also have to possibly employ an organization to recover your data. 
And if we think about, for example, ransomware attacks where your information is uh, held at ransom, you would have to also pay for that data to be released if you don't have an organization that assists you with that. And then finally, the probably the biggest damage or the biggest risk of any data breach is litigation. So depending on who the users are that have been have been targeted or that have been breached, they may go to they may place lawsuits against your organization and start suing you for for litigation in terms of common law principles because of your information that has been lost in because you didn't follow the right standards and procedures or policies. Now the last point is informing your users, and this is what is very important with most data protection laws right now, taking into consideration the GDPR. It has a clause which says you have to inform your user of a data breach. The minute that you do that, you are protected against all other, or most you mitigate most of the risk of all other damages that can ensue. And this is why it is so important for us to have data protection laws in Namibia, because it allows us to inform the user, it allows organizations to be protected against risk or at least mitigate the risk. It gives you as the user more control and possibilities to have access to your information. So thank you very much. Um, I will now start a bit of a discussion with uh, Joseph Hutt, who has joined us. Um, and if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Or if you have any comments, please uh, feel free to comment now. So one question from the audience that I would like to bring up in regards to yes. which parties are responsible for drafting the data protection policy. This is from Thomas. In terms of data protection policies, and I, with with uh, with us not having the right rules and regulations in place, we are trying to create industry standards. Um, we can always take certain cybersecurity matters and take the policies drafted for organizations, assist with the uh, with the testing, and then. You can implement that policy for your own safeguard. Look, most policies allow you to give training to your employees. Now, hypothetically saying, like Andrew mentioned, there was an email sent around. Most in the, most employees would open up an email and say, okay, this is a trusted with, with the training and the policies that would give the guidelines to the organizations. And the responsibility would fall upon the organization to really implement the policy, give that training to your, to your staff members, give them that insight that they need give them the training that they need to understand what are phishing mails, what are what are the what are the damages or the reputation of what, what are the risks of not following the policies, not only from a labor but also from a from a user's point of view. I hope that answers the question um, to to an extent. And uh, from my side what I would just like to input on that is that there is a lot of industry um, provided template standards guidance documentation that you can use for developing your own internal, internal data privacy, such as ISO 27001, uh, which is freely available. You can use the GDPR as a reference document, for example, and uh, take uh, some of the lessons and guidelines taken from that. Um, another question from Louise. Um, are there any laws or policies on data collection and keeping paper trail on this information? Well, yes, uh, Louis, thank you very much for the question. So in terms of um, currently, like like I said, currently Namibia does not have any, any data protection laws. They are in the drafting process, however, and I know, Andrew, <laughs> you might, <laughs> you might uh, try and stop me here, but I always speak about GDPR, General Data Protection Regulations. Gives you the protection that you need within the organization, but it also protects you from international uh, litigation matters because it really sets the guidelines. It, it says how the how the institutions can collect information. What can you do with that information? And yes, I know <laughs> I, I'm a big. <laughs> I speak a lot about uh, general data protection regulations because it it really sets guidelines. But the minute that we have this law enacted in Namibia, then there will be those guidelines for safeguarding information for protection of information. And Yes, depending on the institution as well, there are different laws out there. For example, like the banking uh, banking law that allows you, if you're a, if you're banking institution, to use part of that law. The Electronic Transactions Act it doesn't completely make a reference to data protection. There is short parts of consumer protection in there, but it is not really all that influential yet. So I'm really waiting for the cybersecurity and the data protection laws. But my best bet to implement a, a GDPR policy. 
All right. I think with that, you can um, take over with the final discussion. All right. Uh, Joseph, good afternoon. Are you with us? Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me well? Uh, yes, Excellent. I can hear you very well. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us on this webinar. I highly appreciate your, your efforts and your time in this. Joseph, as I had mentioned, you are the Vice President of the Internet Society of Namibian Chapter. Um, taking this into consideration and the Internet Society being a non-profit organization, have they taken a stand on the lack of data protection laws in Namibia? And if so, what are your stands in terms of that? Thank you. Um, yes, as, as of Namibia, because we are an international, we're a local chapter of an international organization, which is ISO Global based in the States. Um, data protection has been an issue that we as ISO has actually been engaging in. Firstly, I would say that we are much more privileged to have a memorandum of understanding with the Ministry of Information and Communication Technology. So that has provided an avenue and a space for us as a chapter to engage on different policies and matters within the Ministry of Information. Um, against that and through that memorandum of understanding, so we have also, we currently also serve on the committee that is busy drafting the data protection bill, I mean, data protection law in Namibia. And uh, we have also um, taken this stance in terms of raising awareness on this issue during different avenues. One of them is that as a local chapter, the Internet Society has also submitted a report to the United Nations under a program called the uh, universal periodic reviews. So uh, Namibia is being reviewed this year in March, already this month, on different issues uh, that the country is facing. And uh, we as Internet Society has made a report or a submission to the United Nations. And one of the topics that we have also been, that we have submitted this report on is on the data protection and privacy in Namibia. Uh, thank you very much, Joseph. Um, having having obviously spoken about the, the matter, um, you you would obviously say that there's an urgency and also an urgency for for Namibia to implement this law. Is that correct? Very much. So you see that uh, that this. Uh, who do you think um, should be driving this urgency? Do you think it is uh, a part of the uh, Namibian cons uh, culture? Do you think it is also industry standards? Who do you think uh, should drive this urgency? Who do you believe in your in your in your uh, opinion, as uh, the driving force behind the urgency of this matter? Yes, um, I think data protection is an issue that does affect it in each and every one of us, especially now in terms of COVID-19. We have seen in situation where we have been required to submit our information in different spaces, of what we have not know, we currently also do not know where this information goes to. There was a report that was also reported by the Namibian newspaper of um, one of the data register that was stolen at one of the shopping center. And we don't know what happened to that or what, um, I mean, happened to that documentation. And um, what I think who should actually be taking this, I believe that it should be a multi-stakeholder approach. It needs each and everyone to sort of like give their input and create the agency of this matter. So it can be government, can be civil society, can be the academia and, and, and all the other key stakeholders on this. And most importantly, I think it should also be a, an approach of where we just do not try to have it locally, but also to try and reach also internationally. And I think that is one of the reason why we as Internet Society has made that approach to the Universal Periodic Review so that this issue can then be also addressed at the United Nation level. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, Joseph. Sorry, I just want to quickly see. There is a question from from Louise. So I just I'm going to read this quickly, and then I'll, I'll answer the question as well. So if I align my organisation with the GDPR regulations, I could possibly be in line with what uh, Namibia might follow in terms of data protection of regulation. Just to answer that question. Uh, this would be part and part, um, Louis. Uh, this would be part and part, Louise. You would um, be protected not only nationally, but you would be protected most internationally. You collect information. So GDPR would set certain guidelines for you. Now, we need, we need to also understand that GDPR regulates data collection of European citizens. And um, if you were to follow parts of the regulations, you would 
you would uh, be somewhat protected against data protection if you collect information of, of European citizens. Um, and this is the reason why we, we, we see urgency in the matter for Namibia to have an act specifically designed for the Namibian market. But it is, it is uh, part and part something that you could process and you could follow through and say, okay, I am protected under GDPR. That means I'm compliant with GDPR. If there is any information collected from an international or a European citizen, and there is a data breach, you would have to follow those processes set out in GDPR. So yes, um, part and parts, you would be protected on, on uh, if you had a GDPR policy. Um, second question was, what will the implementation of the regulation mean for companies that are already in existence, uh, in existence collecting all kinds of data? A very good question. The thing is, uh, data is collected everywhere, uh, Louise. Um, whether we like it or not, we do it voluntarily and involuntarily. I call it, mm -hmm. uh, most cookie organ uh, most companies can, can collect information on a cookie database, or they, they you voluntarily say, "Listen, my name is Kai Klangeter." Um, it would just give you guidelines to protect that information. So hypothetically saying that there is a data breach, you would have to follow right, the right procedures to inform users of a data breach. And it would allow you to be protected or at least mitigate the risk of, of, uh, of a certain lawsuit being launched against you. So that that, that is what, uh, what GDPR, what these data protection regulations put in place. They both mitigate the risk for the user, but also the risk for the, for the company. And it would allow you to you know, to protect that information as far as you could. Okay, so I just want to quick. Um, all right, so Joseph, you made mention that there is a draft bill with regards to data protection law. Um, do you know if uh, the, or if the Internet Society had input on this drafting and what is your take? How, do, how long would, do you think it would take for this uh, draft bill to be become a promulgated act? Do you have a guideline there for us or give it maybe just a guideline or a time frame for the promulgation of the act? Yeah. Um, yes, there is a data protection draft in place already. Uh, sorry about that. There's a data protection uh, bill already in, in place. And uh, last year, the Minister of Information and Communication Technology actually hosted a stakeholders consultation on the data protection bill, which took place from the 1st of September to around the 15th of October. And in this uh, stakeholders consultation, so they had different clusters or different phases, which were part and parcel of this. So they invited the government officers, the ministries, agencies. Uh, there were some law enforcement um, representative. There were some ISP and telecommunication licensees. The banking sectors were also invited to be part of this consultation, the civil society and media houses, academias, and local as well as regional um, councils. So as ISOC, since we are also part of this uh, committee that is busy in drafting this, we have also added our inputs on that. In terms of uh, how long this might take is that as a... The ministry have are uh, busy in, in terms of finalizing now all the inputs that were received through this stakeholders consultation so that then this goes into the next phase of where this draft now has to um, be tabled into parliament. And then only after the parliamentarians have looked into it because it's a lengthy process. So it, it, it's a document that requires um, stakeholders input. And then after the stakeholders input have added their inputs, then they, those inputs are being drafted and then they are sent back to stakeholders to make sure that um, they speak to what they said and or what they recommended and so forth. And then from there, it goes through the different phases and until it goes into the parliament. Once it end up at the parliament, the parliamentarians look into it and if they like it, then they approve. If they don't like it, then it's being brought back again to fix the few issues. So it's, it's sort of like a lengthy process process, if I may put it in that way. Um, so I hope that it's going to be tabled this year. We are not sure. Um, as far as I know is that I've not seen the data protection bill uh, being part or being placed under this year's uh, bills that needs to be sort of like approved. Uh, so I would have to see also in that and I will also sort of like communicate also in the committee just to see about that. Um, in terms of also the time frame, um, unfortunately, uh, I can 
be able to provide that feedback maybe at a later stage with Kai or so, because I know that as Internet Society, we are part of that committee. So I'll just go to our chapters committee just to know about the time frame and, and the length, how long this might take, if it was ever discussed in that committee, and then revert back on that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joseph, for that information. My final question to you is, do you, um, did any, during the drafting phase, was there any type of input from, you know, external stakeholders? Was there input from, you know, experts in the industry? My, uh, my question is based on, on if the experts in the industry itself had also some input in the draft bill. I would believe so because um, since I mentioned before that there were different stakeholders that were invited at this uh, in terms of the civil society, the academia, the IXC and so forth, as well as also the law and the different ministries such as also the, different, the Minister of Justice and the Ministry of Information. So um, there were inputs from that and uh, the ministry has tried and as much as they can to reach to different stakeholders to bring in their inputs of course, here and there, maybe not all the people might be included because perhaps the ministry might not have those specific database of those relevant um, uh, people that should be invited to also add their input. But as far as I know is that the ministry has been trying to reach to different stakeholders for their inputs during that phase that they were drafting that, I mean, that they were having the consultation around the 1st of September to the 15th of October last year. Right, so uh, thank you very much, Joseph. But, um, is there any more questions? Andy, Kai, do you have a question? Yeah. Kai, we've got Peter who would like to jump in here. Um, go ahead, Peter. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, um, well, just want to check, can you hear me? Excellent. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so first of all, well done, guys. I think this is great um, it's, um, to see that we have a discussion on this. Um, Maybe just for context, I'm a doctoral researcher in this space, um, but also involved with a number of corporates. Well, I'm actually currently at a corporate in Namibia. Um, my concern is, guys, with all of these things, um, by the way, I was also involved with Poppy in South Africa um, and um, was asked in 2018 to, to be a panelist uh, around the discussion in Brinsuk around GDPR. Um, my concern is, guys, it's 2021, three years later, and with all due respect, um, gov government is going to take a long time because this is just, and I think it's incorrectly informed and, and please let it be like, like it be, but my concern is it's more a industry problem. It is a, it's a consumer problem. It is a company problem. Um, and we can have these debates. I mean, if you look at that, um, your, your slide um, earlier, look at that, most of those bills, I mean, just the transaction well, just recently came through. And that was, I think, if I remember correctly, it's, it, it's a number of years. So my concern is what do we do as consumers in Namibia? And is there an opportunity that we as an industry can take this, this bull by the horn and um, try to rather, like with the internet society, et cetera, try to drive it faster and create the urgency? Because I can tell you now, this is not number one priority at the company. Yes, um, thank you very much, Peter, for that. Um, I've, I fully agree with you. I think it is, uh, unfortunately, at this stage, not a big urgent matter. Uh, we are hoping that it becomes an urgency quicker than, uh, than we believe, and we hope so. But yes, I, I do hear what you're saying. As, as, as um, the community here, we also wish to drive something forward. Uh, and we also, I'm actively in assisting the Internet Society as well to get this drive going, to get this information out as quickly as possible. But I think also from a consumer point of view, there is, there is a need for, for data privacy. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I fully agree with you in this perspective. So yeah, um, um, just from my sorry. side, input quickly. Um, the, the whole objective of this uh, webinar is essentially to drive um, especially industry awareness and within yeah. the uh, focus, especially on the tourism sector in Namibia, a lot of the um, uh, various business interests to actually get an awareness of the problem that we have, that we can start directly first phase uh, attacking the problem with industry best practice standards and compliance that you can implement on your own each individually. 
And then second of all, you, once that first wave initiative has taken place, uh, move uh, that forward into actual official government legislation. Uh, just to, to show like, here's what we can do. Um, why are you government not doing anything to enforce this uh, after that, essentially? So yeah, I very much agree there with Peter. Yeah, I, I think as well, we've spoken about it before. There's almost, sorry, Joseph, I know you want to jump in here. Yeah, um, <laughs> um, it's almost like a troika. You've got between big corporations, you've got between the citizenry, and then you've got with government. And it's in that troika that we need to resolve this issue at the end of the day, because the one thing we mustn't forget is that um, um, the internet, the World Wide Web is transnational. So a set of laws in one country won't be applicable in another country. So really steering it towards an industry standard is possibly where we should be going. Um, in the meantime, while we have a lack of uh, legislation, Kai, Question for you, will the data protection bill make it more difficult, difficult for journalists to acquire information? And there, will there be protection for journalists once they gain the information that is not through regular means? We actually covered this in our previous webinar on background checks, but jump in there um, with, a, with an answer. Yes, uh, so certain information would be more difficult to obtain. So especially if you do background checks, um, like Andrew mentioned, uh, you would be it would be more difficult for you to go through all the background checks because uh, that consent that we discussed last time was uh, would be needed from individuals um, with regards to investigative journalism. Certain information will still be available to users, but it would make it somewhat difficult um, in that sense because you would have to acquire certain consent, especially in the background checks now with. With uh, journalism, there's always a uh, the freedom of uh, expression, the right to freedom of expression, which is also, yeah, it can be limited. But um, with regards to, to journalism, there's still that freedom to inform people. And I know that Joseph Hutt is also uh, very big in, in, or he's big in journalism as well. He writes articles, so he knows about this. Uh, so, yes, there would be, a, I wouldn't say it's a difficulty. It would just be a bit more... Um, tricky to obtain a certain information that's why there would be uh, background checks done or information gathered on, on in different perspectives especially when it comes to the consent of, of matters um, then just uh, there's another question from Jeanette so does the fact that we may not have data protection law make it more difficult to sue big corporations when you when your information is breached as individuals so we probably all know, most of us <laughs> 98% of us probably have all Facebook, so yes. <laughs> there has been data breaches at Facebook. There has been data breaches at Google. You can, if you're protected on the GDPR, sue certain organizations, but this would become a collective uh, lawsuit. So we, we can also do this in a movie when there's too many, too many uh, individuals wanting to sue. There's a collective lawsuit opened up against organizations. Uh, individually, you could try um, if you have the time and the money for it because I think they have quite a lot to spend on certain information, a lot to spend on lawsuits. But that's why with data protection laws, you would have governing bodies called regulators. So uh, in Europe, for example, you would have the Ireland regulatory body that regulates how data, uh, how data is protected. And they, they see an issue with the data protection um, problem or if there's a leak of data protection and user has not been informed, they start suing for you on behalf of so we, with us, uh, with the data protection was you'd have data regulators in place to assist you with matters going forward. And this is with, um, um, the, with the California Consumer Protection Act. If I, I just need to uh, make sure on that. I don't know if GDPR, for example, they do have data regulator, con yeah, regulatory bodies in place that assist with, uh, with processes going forward of, of uh, uh, placing lawsuits against people or organizations. Joseph, do you also just wanted to quickly mention something? I just want to give him a chance, Andrew, and then uh, I think we can hand over to Rigo. All right, yes. Um, mine was just really an emphasis or a, a, an add on to the question that was raised in terms of the agencies of really having these. And I believe that, you know, as internet society, we have been a big advocate on this. And one of the things that I also did not mention is that we have done a research on data protection and privacy in Namibia. 
uh, especially in times of COVID-19. So it will be finalized anytime soon now. So we did that also with an organization, um, uh, CIPESA, which is the Collaboration for Eastern and Southern African Policy. Uh, so that will also be launched where we did a research in terms of COVID-19, how has data been violated and so forth and so on. And uh, I've, we, as Internet Society, we are also part of an organization called the Action Coalition. And uh, that is a coalition of different civil society organizations that has been also pushing in terms of um, raising awareness on the importance of data protection in Namibia. And that is also the reason why um, Action, I mean, Internet Society and Action Coalition members have also been writing articles in the newspapers in terms of the importance and agency of really having a data protection. And I think one of the most important thing that has really made this issue a very, very important issue that needs to be addressed urgently is because of the whole issues of also COVID-19, because COVID-19 has really presented to us on how our data can be violated, how our data can be used for other things. And without us actually you know, having any control on that because it's, a, it's, a, it's an emergency crisis and certain information are needed and you just have to provide them because they are needed based on health, which is of course, I mean, a critical issue, but then what happens after you have given your information? That is a big question mark. And I think that is why we need to address this issue. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph, for that input. I think that is very valuable, especially considering COVID-19 and the COVID-19 regulations. So um, just to move a little bit faster, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Rigo Redick. Uh, you've also prepared a presentation, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, absolutely. Just All right, thank you very much, Rigo. Uh, Okay, so can everyone see my presentation here? Excellent, super. So this is gonna be a sort of a crash course on uh, user data collection and how it all goes horribly wrong when you don't have any kind of legal, whatever standards, prosecution, etc. what you might need in place, or even if you do have those in place. So first of all, what are data? And you might think that was that's spelled wrong. What is data? No, data is not it written with is, it's, a more, uh, it's plural. Um, so data are raw context agnostic facts, often numeric, that are collected through observation or any other means. They're not processed into a specific context. It's just the whole thing, data versus information. Information is processed and it's contextualized to a specific fact or a specific scenario or something that we want to know. Um, it's not just a whole telephone directory, it's say a specific area or specific location or person in telephone directory. So data on the internet, what are the obvious things? Websites and article contents, video, music, software, email, user details and your profile, whatever that might be. Um, could include your identity number or some kind of profile identifier, um, some interests of yours, uh, research data that's published, something that they logged off a sensor or satellite images, etc weather information, maps, databases of all sorts, shapes, and forms. And then we get to the sort of infrastructure part of the website uh, of the internet domain names. That would be, say, www.google.com. That's a domain name. And that's basically um, what maps to the actual physical system behind it. And then the rest of the infrastructure of the internet. I won't go into that because that's not pertinent at this point stage. So then we have metadata. Data about data, or as I like to call it, your digital breadcrumb trail for marketers and everyone that wants to misuse your data in interesting ways. Uh, what kind of metadata do we have on the web? This is basically the non-content content. Uh, what you see is the content, and this is all the stuff that holds the content together. Um, first of all, you've got your file types. You've probably seen music files, MP4, MP3, WAV. Then we've got general formatting, how our website is laid out. And then we've got the hypertext markup language, uh, which defines sort of how the sentences are formed, where the links in the page are, and all that type of stuff. And all the various code comments that get lost in there uh, for us developers to find. Then we have descriptive metadata that can be any types of titles, your post title, uh, date and time, when something was published, when you edited it. Uh, the publisher who authored a piece of content, and then the specific keywords. So when a search engine indexes, 
a specific post? What are the big phrases in that thing that uh, you could search for? So if you're writing an article about dogs, there might be a bunch of different dog breeds as keywords in that article. Then we've got the administrative type of metadata. That's all your activity history. What were you doing? Uh, where did you click? Um, when was something published? Uh, who edited it? When was it edited, etc. Then we've got restrictions and allowances. Uh, you're probably familiar with that on Facebook. If you post an article or a topic, you can restrict who gets to see it, uh, your friends, your family, everyone, and everyone, or friends of friends, etc. Then we've got reference metadata. This is any kind of links on the web that you're clicking on. And then directories, as an example, uh, that might be a phone book, that might be a list of websites. Um, Google search is a type of directory. Um, if you have, say, Wikipedia that lists all type of vehicles, that's another directory. Uh, statistical, so this is essentially processed data th that describes how metadata is processed, gets really obtuse, and we're not going to get into that. And then we've got the legal aspect, ownership, copyright, and licensing, all those things around how a video is allowed to be distributed, who made it, who gets to use it, and so forth. Now we've gone through that. What kind of user data actually gets collected, and uh, specifically the non-obvious things? So first of all, there's two categories. We've got behavioral data, and we've got profile data. Behavioral data, it's all about what you do when you're online. When are you active? When have you opened an app? When have you closed it? How long have you been reading a certain article? Uh, how long have you had your phone screen on and off? Um, how do you search things? Uh, the types of phrases you put in? Um, do you ask it questions? Do you just smash in some keywords and hit enter? How fast you scroll? Um, it's an indicator if you're interested in a subject or just running by looking for something else. So if you scroll by fast, they classify is not that interested. If you stop and stop slowly scrolling over something, they rate that as more interesting. Facebook does that. When your mouse or finger moves, um, lovely thing that Facebook and Google do, tracking all over the page what you hover over, where your thumb on your uh, smartphone lies, how fast you click on something. Um, is, the, is the search result or the specific topic or the advert, um, did you look at it for a long time before deciding? Did you immediately click it because it's exactly what you were looking for? Uh, another one is when you were, say, purchasing stuff. It's useful information uh, in terms of if a company sent out a discount campaign or a coupon and then shortly after you decided to purchase that based on that coupon. And then also how, when, and to what re you react. If you're going through Facebook, looking at your friend's posts, hitting like, uh, love, heart, angry, whatever, all those types of things, um, they are used to inform the profile data. Specifically, can I close this? I don't go away. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Who you are, so your interest categories, um, what do you like to read, um, who do you search for, um, where would you like to go on holiday, um, anything that might inform what you like, uh, which pizza toppings you prefer, etc. Um, your beliefs, um, aliens are real, aliens are not real, um, the earth is flat, etc. Yeah, your specific ethnicity, race, nationality, and any kind of identifying documents, uh, some websites like Facebook ask you that um, ask you to submit a copy of your passport to prove you're a real person. If they have doubt that you are a real person, it gets a bit shady. Then what you like to call static data, that is data that's unlikely to ever change uh, once it's been set. So your birthday, your gender, hometown, and addresses you've previously lived at. And then as part of that, but more flexible because you may have multiple that get correlated over a while, your usernames emails and financial status, which can include credit, your account balances, and any kind of purchasing history that you might have. PayPal is one that comes to mind that likes to overshare that with everyone. So what's all this for? Marketing, of course. We're correlating facts, timed events, keywords, and analysis uh, to create our behavioral and profile data so that we can market you random things you anyway not going to buy. And those ads get sold for a certain cost per click. And that money, which they are sold for, goes back to the 
person that is hosting those ads or part of it shared with the person that published the ad, whatever variety it might be. But the key issue in this is your data is being mined to the absolute maximum depth legally or not legally allowable by law. So what's the big saying recently? Data is the new oil. There's a big essentially oil rush to collect all the information possibly that companies can before some kind of new legislation locks it down and restricts what you're allowed to collect because then you are left with the rare and exclusive data that was collected before it was locked down and you are the only one that has it and can trade it at a nice premium cost. Now, what's, what do some companies like to collect about you? Um, who knows the most? Facebook, absolutely everything. Um, they'll get your email, your age, your gender, your sexual orientation, your marital status, your race, your religious belief, um, live locations you've been, your home addresses, based on which Wi-Fi network you most often connect to, job title, pet or animal ownership, uh, based on how many cat pictures you upload, for example, um, your landline number, if they can get it, um, types of phone or device that you're using, if you're a Samsung user, iPhone user, they can even tell if you're a specific diehard uh, brand fan and they will market you stuff from that brand, um, your particular hobbies that you post on, um, interests based on what you look at, read about, or post about most, your height and weight. Um, this is a bit obscure, but your phone has an accelerometer in it that can track your gait. Um, and that is basically how you step or walk. Based on the way you step and walk and the length of your steps, uh, we can calculate your height using a well-known mathematical formula. And using the speed at which you walk a certain distance, we can also approximate your weight. Um, uh, next of kin, that's usually um, who you link to the profile as an uh, emergency contact, for example. Mother's maiden name, that's usually filled in as part of the password recovery process. Your current employers, um, you might be connecting to your work Wi-Fi or writing about them or just directly posting where you work on your profile. Past employers, obviously, is part of that. Bank account details, this slips in somewhere. Facebook hasn't got it. Salary, they don't really care. They just want to market you best your interest and make lots of cash from that. Social profile, friends, hobbies, etc. So they will build a profile of you and also your friends, family, uh, and everything else they can possibly attach to you about that. And what do you know, it gets abused. Facebook has fired a bunch of employers for sleeping users, either their girlfriends or their spouses or anything else that they could possibly get. Because what are humans gonna do when they have the data at the fingertips with no one looking at how they're allowed to access it? So data collection, how does it mostly get collected? So we've either got background scripts on the website, um, JavaScript, that runs, it doesn't really tell you that it's running, it's just there with several other advertising agencies um, which all set their cookies on the website to tell you were here. Um, a cookie is basically what I call a digital armband. If you've ever been to a music event um, to allow you to come in multiple times without paying again, they give you a little tag on your arm and then you present that and you, they know, okay, this person's been here before, you can go right in. And that's what a cookie is. As you travel around the web, this cookie gets put on you and whenever you go to a website, you present that cookie and the website knows, oh, this is this person, I know where you've been and I can look up all the past history that's logged with the advertising provider about where this cookie has been and what you are interested in. Then we have logging systems. Um, these are things that essentially run either as part of your internet, internet service providers infrastructure, a website's uh, backend um, that logs users connections, when you connect, um, what sort of traffic you browse, what time of day you do it. And then they might be indirectly selling that again to another agency or business or advertising person. Um, then we've got lookup services. Um, that is essentially like public telephone directories, um, big Wi-Fi maps of the world, um, address locations where some data aggregator can go in they have a user profile from someone that signed up to a page, and then they can search for you in this and attach this to add profile for additional information. Then we've got exchange programs, especially government, such as the Five Eyes program. 
Um, Five Eyes is basically a collection of countries around the world, United States, Australia, UK, are the prominent ones that all agreed to um, share data between each other about their citizens. And it is broadly overreaching with very few restrictions. Then the other option is you buy data outright. Um, this is oftentimes legal, but extremely gray area and shady. And there'll be some examples of that coming up. And then just directly steal it, um, either copying a drive from your competitor's database, uh, give some money to an employee, you know who's employed there, what their interests are, blah, blah, blah. Um, or if you want to set up a clone, say, of um, the a popular travel website, and you want to have pre-filled reviews of your travel website to make it look lived in as if it's got lots of users and it's immediately launching overnight, you might steal all the content from the website and copy it into yours with a couple of changes. So that's one of the forms of data collection. Now, five eyes, nine eyes, and 14 eyes alliances, five eyes are directly sharing, nine eyes are contributory and under some conditions, they gain access to data from the Five Eyes nations, and 14 eyes are just contributing to the Nine Eyes and Five Eyes programs. So, how does data generally get stored? The magical cloud. What is the cloud? There is no cloud, it's someone else's computer. And as we've recently seen in France with the Strasbourg data center, that other computer can also burn down. You can look that up in the news if you want to. But what actually runs on those systems? We've got popular applications like MySQL, Microsoft SQL, Mongo database, which calls itself a NoSQL database, um, Cassandra, Couchbase, and Oracle. These are some of the big brands. And then one of the most popular ones in the industry is Amazon S3 buckets, which are very prone to misconfiguration, along with Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is basically a system that allows you to build your own Google search engine at home, I like to call it. Uh, Google search engine in the box. So you can give it a whole bunch of data and then make it searchable in a nice structured format. But databases are complex and mistakes will be made as usual. And the type of couple of different mistakes that commonly get made on the user or operator side, misconfiguration, they set the thing up without reading the user manual documentation and leave default passwords, say. Uh, they don't restrict what each user can access on the database. So everyone can access each other's records without really any limitations. Um, an HR person uh, should just need access to the employee records, for example, in the database perhaps, but not everyone else that's also on the application user uh, database section. So former rogue employees or former employees the, whose access to the database doesn't get disabled once they leave and they might be a bit annoyed with you for how they got fired and then they will see what profit or interesting dirty information they can dig out of your database then there's the other thing unqualified administrators that have absolutely no idea what they're doing they're just copy pasting things from stack overflow or random tutorials on the internet putting together your database and it's got holes and alternative access modes and bugs everywhere then what I like to call Fridays or Mondays, someone was asleep, wasn't paying attention, they entered the wrong thing, uh, left open a testing or debug feature, shipped the application to Google Play, and the next thing you know, everyone can access each other's profile without actually being logged into them. That's happened more than once. And lastly, social engineering, you get a particularly crafty email that impersonates, say, another employee or a manager that says, I immediately right now need access to this feature on the server. There's been a horrible mistake and we need to fix this. Please call me. Um, this is my number. I need the password. Uh, people might die, et cetera, et cetera, unless I get in. And then the panicked person in HR that you call does know and just gets you in somewhere. And then on the technical developer side, what I call insecure by default, and that is referring specifically to applications that ship with insecure configurations by default. So you set them up as they are and they have horrible defaults that are only suitable for development and needs to be manually disabled um, to actually use this program in a public scenario. Then the other one is lacking access controls. This is more prevalent than you might think. Mongo for a long time had no real user levels or restrictions and everyone was just an administrator. Um, default passwords, um, admin, username, password one, two, three, uh, 
this is the test, all kinds of varieties that get left in there. And the last but most common software vulnerabilities. We're all human, somewhere the programmer wasn't uh, having a great day and made a small mistake in the code that lets someone exploit it. And that's how we get onto what the most common types of data breaches or data loss forms are. Smallest one, lost or improper disposable. Uh, personal information wasn't shredded, it was just thrown in a dumpster. Someone came by and picked it all up and, oh, hey, we've got some ID numbers and we've got some credit information. Off we are to credit fraud. Um, then we've got internal theft. Some employee with access to things that they shouldn't have or just couldn't help themselves runs off with some data, makes some copies just in case. Then we've got third party vendors, um, vendors that you are sharing data with um, who have access to your database um, that are I don't know, there's all kinds of reasons that they come up with to sell your data, copy it, use it for other own profit uh, gains, um, so forth. External theft, that is if someone actually physically breaks into your premises or manages to uh, deploy some malware onto your system to copy the data. If you didn't have proper security measures in place to prevent that. Then one of the largest employee action or mistake, um, that is uh, someone inadvertently giving out information. Uh, they were called, they were asked for information, they didn't know what to do, it's the first day on their job, it's an intern, and they hand out something that they're not supposed to, for example, or a employer just leaves a, a laptop at a coffee shop and someone else comes by and picks it up. And then one of the biggest ones, phishing, malware, and hacking, um, those usually get promulgated through social engineering attacks whereby someone gets an attachment that they execute. Okay, so how does it all go wrong? We've seen a couple of examples. We've got data leaks, we've got hacks, we've got shady ethics, we've got rogue insiders, and we've got the fun data traders. Let's go through some examples of data breaches. As you know, there are only two types of databases, those who know they've been hacked and those that are still going to be hacked. And like I say, databases are complex. Medical data leaked on GitHub due to developer errors. And how much was that? 200,000 patient records were stored on Office 365 and Google G Suite because someone hard coded the access password to admin admin. Fabulous. Um, then my most famous one, uh, popular one, S3 data buckets that are improperly configured, which you can really just search for using certain Google search strings and tools. And uh, you can go browsing through the backend data storage database of some really, really big companies. And this just this past month, some mobile app leaks, uh, telemarketing company that leaked 140,000 users, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Just drop S3 data leaks into Google and you'll have a fun time exploring all the terrible data leaks. So much so that there's actually a GitHub repository with a big, nice uh, curated list of Amazon S3 data leaks, which you can browse through uh, at your <laughs> leisure and see what interesting things you can find. So ethics, when it's legal, but you kind of question if it really is. Department of Motor Vehicle in the US makes 50 million bucks a year selling drivers personal information to private businesses, and it's been declared legal in court, but you really wonder what the heck are they doing. Uh, this should not be the case, and I'm wondering if something like this isn't happening here as well, but you don't know about it. And the other thing, it was a prayer app for a specific uh, religious group that was selling all their users' information, uh, where they are, geolocations, when they're using the app, uh, how often they're praying to all sorts of businesses. And one of those businesses happened to be a front for the US government looking for terrorists. Um, then a fun one, the list of third parties other than PayPal customers with whom personal information is stored. And that is a list of 600 long. You can search this up. PayPal has to provide it under the new GDPR regulations. Previously, they did not. Uh, some fun ones in that are, say, this Sutherland Global Services Inc. USA, who is sharing your account balance, transaction information, customer statements, and everything else with uh, PayPal selling and everything. We've got one from South Africa and New Zealand, which also actually applies to Namibia, exchange for free, which are selling your name, address, details of user funding, influence, and digital payment transactions. So that's basically all your payment slip details and whatever interesting stuff they might be doing with that. Rogue Insiders, that's the next one. I can't, yeah, take advantage. 
half of Minnesota law enforcement users, that is police, were misusing database searches to look up details on spouse, possible relationships, um, people that they thought were cheating on them, all kinds of things. Uh, this was mainly allowed due to uncontrolled access so that any random police officer in the department had access to that not one specific data clerk who was responsible for controlling what was being looked up. And again, Uber famously for the Uber app, they built themselves a nice God mode that the executives were using to spy on any random user and they could see basically a live map of where all Uber users in the world were currently traveling around. And uh, yeah, this is a whole dirty mess that you can look up if you would like. Another one, Associated Press, <laughs> found that uh, most of US police were abusing confidential databases for all kinds of personal reasons. They just can't help themselves and there's no control in place to prevent it. FCC <laughs> found that ATT employees were selling uh, SIM card information and associated stuff to Mexican cartels and all kinds of odd things for SIM swap scams. And then another one, Morgan Stanley Insider employee that was selling, a, or had access to about 10% of the investment records of a large company and pasted them all onto the internet on Pastebin. And where does this all lead us? Um, this use of personal data is currently being perceived as the leading cause of tech industry mistrust above the fear of automation taking jobs away, above the fear of unethical innovation, above the fact that a few wealthy elite are centralizing all of the money and way far above the working conditions that a lot of tech employees complain about due to the terrible hours they're forced to work. And with that, I want to leave you with a statement from Gary Kovacs. Privacy is not an option, and it shouldn't be the price we accept for just getting on the internet. You previously started at AVG Technologies, then went on to IBM before being key in uh, developing uh, Mozilla Firefox's privacy initiatives. And so with that, on to the questions. OK. Um, thank you, Rigo. Um, Kai, we've got we've got quite a few questions, so yes. um, I'm going to give you some, and I'm going to give Rigo some, and not to be left out, I'll give myself one as well. <laughs> All right, so yes, uh, Rigo. Okay, great. All right, the first one is how does how does the access of information bill table 2020 impact on the data protection draft? I think it's for both you and Joseph. Yes. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, D. Um, so first and foremost, the Access to Information Act, um, what this allows is it, it, it gives us right to access to information, which is um, mostly pertaining to the facility of transparency, accountability, and good governance within organizations, both public but also governmental organizations. Now, what is very important here is Section 64, and I'll gladly share this um, with Andrew. He can then um, maybe just send it onwards to everybody. Um, I'll just quickly read this into the records or into the so what the access information act may uh, allows you yes it, it's not going to um it's going to be if it is in the public interest it's going to be more important than the public data protection so it stipulates here that public interest overrides the other interest so if there's data protection law in place and let's hypothetically say mr x is uh, has, is involved in corrupt activity then the access to information act takes precedent over that it will allow you to have access to the information because the, uh, the corruption is in has to be seen in the light of the public or the whole whole Namibian public. It is more important to the Namibian public than to protect certain information. So, with that regard, the um, the Access to Information Act will take precedence over certain information, especially when it comes to corrupt dealings or um, if it has to do with serious public health or safety risks or the imminent uh, serious environmental risks. So there are certain se sections that will take precedence of the data protection uh, regulation. Um, that's, uh, and I'll gladly share this information with, uh, with uh, you, Andrew, so you can share it with the participants. I hope that answers part of the question because the Access to Information Act allows us to understand better governance and it creates a better uh, industry for everybody, the whole of Namibia, where data protection is for certain individuals. If, for example, if I do a background check or if I um, I, um, I need access to information, 
that information is protected by either the company or the uh, system that is uh, in place um, and will not immediately give me access to that information. But if it comes to uh, matters like, um, like I said, matters that involve the overall public interest, then it takes precedence over the access to uh, over the Protect Data Protection Act. Joseph, do you want to add anything to that? <clears throat> I think Kai has already alluded to all the information. So when it comes to access to information, it it will become more uh, important in you know when it comes to issues that are of serious concern be, to the country, be it corruption, be it health issues, and so forth, as opposed to data protection. But then every other thing is more or less basically what Kai has already alluded to. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, Kai, Peter asks, will a Namibian tourism institution be liable to GDPR fines if they disclose or lose EU tourist information? Um, Peter, thank you very much for that and from, uh, for that question. I think, um, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> so the, the what GDPR creates, it creates, this, uh, it creates this principle of extra juridical jurisdiction which means that it does not stop at cross, it doesn't stop at borders, it crosses the borders. So any type of, because data is collected cross, uh, around the world, it doesn't matter if I'm living in, in Namibia and I'm connected to Facebook, which has the servers in South Africa and in America, for example, if they start collecting my information and they breach my information, they will be held liable under GDPR, which has happened in the past. And yes, uh, with tourism companies, there is that fear that uh, if you collect information of European citizens, and you do not protect that information and that server is breached or that information is uh, disclosed to a third party and that user finds out about it and you have not informed them within the specific time periods. Okay, I'm talking, I just need to check again. I'm talking on the correction. I think it is uh, 75 hours or something. I, I just need to confirm that again with GDPR. That is the time frame that you have to give it, uh, the user time or tell them this time breach, we are also looking into uh, recovering your information. If you don't do that, then yes, the fines may start rolling in. However, we, um, I haven't seen any uh, any tourism company, as per se, in Africa or in Namibia, having uh, having been sued on the GDPR if there if there has been a data breach. So, yes, not that information or GDPR may become re relevant and re uh, relevant to tourism sectors, even hospitals. Because they also, if we are, uh, if we have uh, South, uh, European citizens here, they are on an accident. You could, the hospitals collecting that information, they need to be GDPR compliant because they need to protect that information. If they're not, then there could be um, issues with um, fines, or, yeah, possible lawsuits. Cool, <clears throat> good stuff. Uh, Jeanette asks, uh, Rigo, this is for you. How secure is software that one buys from other countries, and does the buying of the software increase a company and a country a country's vulnerability digitally so this is this is a whole um, pandora's box of a question as i like to call it because um, the the quality and security of the software depends very much on first and foremost the development process that was used to develop the software the skill of the developers and this the the programming languages nowadays um, that we use to actually develop the programming language or the, or the program. Um, for example, C and C++, which are sort of old school, low level programming languages, um, have something called uh, manual memory management and very few memory protections. That is, if you managing memory inside of your processor, it lets you do anything. It doesn't put any controls or security mitigations or anything on you. That's up to you to do. The benefit of this is really, 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 really fast. So like C, C++ compiled languages run incredibly fast. You can ignore all the security, um, have lots of memory leaks and vulnerabilities and stuff that goes horribly wrong if you don't write that code correctly, which something like Rust, which is a modern memory and type safe data language um, protects you against. It forces the programmer to write correct code. And then with regards to buying from other countries, um, software essentially uh, is often very multinational. Um, the big software that you're using is usually US, European, et cetera based. And the price tag on a software does not necessarily equate quality. 
Um, Oracle is one that I love to bash a lot for that because they charge you millions a year in support fees, etc. And they have the most silly, trivial programming bugs in there. However, I won't go into that because. <clears throat> um, whereas on the other hand, you get uh, open source software or free software uh, where the code is visible to anyone to inspect, usually published on something like GitHub or GitLab repositories or their own website. Uh, and it's the integrity of it is controlled in something like Git or SVN or various other technologies. Um, and you can actually go and review the source code manually. You can hire someone outside. It's not affiliated with the business to look, is this all good? And um, the benefit also, I'm a big open source uh, proponent. Um, with open source code, you've got more eyes inspecting it, including the bad guys. Um, so chances are, if there's a bug, it's going to be found really fast. Whereas in closed source proprietary software, um, the code that was used to generate the actual binary package that you run that is in machine code, bugs can linger in that sometimes for decades and you have no idea what's happening. And that's happening quite a lot these days. Um, just last week, um, there was a bug found in VMware that's been sitting out there in the wild for 10 years, probably exploited for all sorts of things. But I um, hmm. <laughs> hope that answers okay. it to some extent. Cool, and um, we're running out of time. So your next question is, can one delete all cookies that are connected to your internet profile? Um, sort of, yes. Um, most browsers don't really do this by default. You can install certain add-ons that limit that, um, like Privacy Badger by the Electronic Frontier Foundation in the US, not to be confused with the local EFF. Um, then you can also use uBlock Origin, which is a ad blocking add-on browser or browser add-on that also filters a lot of background tracking cookies that are placed by various websites. And then if you want to go really paranoid, um, you can use browsers like Brave, which are focused on uh, cookie segmentation or the Tor browser, um, which connects you through an entirely anonymous multi-layer network to hide behind. But um, just something else that I also want to add to that is Firefox version 85, as of recently, has added a new feature that segments all websites into their own little container so that they can only see the cookies that they themselves set and not see all the advertising agencies, etc. as cookies. It made a lot of advertising companies very angry and annoyed um, because they can't spy on you to the extent that they were before. Chrome has not done that yet. But, um, I think it is due quite soon. Awesome, great stuff. And then just to answer Monica's question, what does it entail to become a cyber investigator? Inquisitiveness will get you a long way. Um, have a mind for facts and get all your details together. That will also assist you and have a stomach that is pretty strong for most situations because on the internet, there's some weird stuff out there. I, I want to, another one. <laughs> to, 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 to answer the question fully in, in, in an environment like this is quite a challenge. So I hope oh, yeah. that just gives you a little bit of background on that. Also understand the field is very broad. There are cyber investigators and there are cyber investigators specializing in different areas. Yeah. Uh, can you become um, a cyber investigator? We provide training in that regard. Rigo, you'll get your turn. Um, <laughs> we do provide training um, in that regard. So if you're keen, um, we can assist you in that. We do have a draw for that, folks. Um, so if you want to be eligible to win a cyber investigation course, put your hat in the, uh, put your, what do they say? Put your hat in the ring. That's right. Rigo. Yeah, I'm just going to add, you need a good sense of humor. Yeah, that too. Helps a lot. <laughs> it did. It did, right. <laughs> Kai, anything more from your side before we wrap up? Um, Rigo, start, you can unmute everybody if you like. Um, Kai, anything? Yes. Uh, from my side, I think uh, this is a very important topic to touch bases on. I think data protection is becoming one of, one of the biggest uh, fields that we, we are all involved in i think uh from the legal side from you know from a human from the consumer's point of side from a user's point of side it is something that is uh that we are facing daily uh, if not hourly if not minute wise i think 
we collect, we, we store, we share information. And I, I think it is uh, very important for us to really start uh, understanding the impacts of data protection for Namibia, but also when you go around the world. So thank you very much again. And also a big thank you to Josepha to who had availed themselves to us. Thank you for your time, Josepha. We highly appreciate it. And also to Andrew and Rigo. Thank you guys. Uh, and also to our participants. Thank you very much for joining us.